people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. The BRICS nations have jointly called for intellectual property rights waiver on vaccines, something which is under consideration at WTO. They have also urged to invoke the flexibilities of the TRIPS agreement. The grouping while deliberating over equitable distribution vaccines also came up with the communique, stating that it was the time when a rules-based world order was created and followed. Just to remind you viewers, the C in BRICS stands for China and it is talking about rules, respect and global welfare. Chaired by Indian Foreign Minister Subramaniam Jay Shankar, a virtual BRICS Foreign Ministers Conference was held to discuss the political and economic roadblocks created by the pandemic. On the 15th anniversary of the Foundation Year of the Grouping, all sides reaffirmed their commitment to further strengthen ties between them at bilateral as well as multilateral level to respond more effectively to the crisis. The BRICS brings together five of the largest developing countries of the world, representing 41% of the global population, 24% of the global GDP, and 16% of the global trade. All sides came to the consensus of sharing vaccine doses, transfer of technology, development of local production capacities and supply chains for medical products, and promotion of price transparency. They also called for timely operationalization of the BRICS Vaccine and Research Development Center. We strive for a fair, just, inclusive, equitable and representative multipolar international system. It is one based on international law and the UN Charter that recognizes the sovereign equality of all states and respects their territorial integrity while displaying mutual respect for interests and concerns of all. The most important takeaway of the BRICS conference was the consensus drawn by all members over the requirement of waiver on vaccines. India and South Africa have been raising the issue of TRIPS, that is trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights, waiver for COVID-19 vaccines. All BRICS countries agreed to support this measure and called for supporting ongoing consideration in WTO on a COVID-19 vaccine intellectual property rights waiver and the use of flexibilities of the TRIPS agreement and the Doha Declaration on TRIPS Agreement and Public Health. Five ministers also agreed that in order to address common challenges, a rule-based international system should be strengthened. A number of observers argue, but China believes and states that it has regarded all the global rules and has been a flag bearer of true multilateralism. Chinese Minister Wang Yi said certain countries are adopting fake multilateralism and putting their own interests above all else. Our cooperation mechanism has been continuously improved and expanded. International influence has been increasing, especially in areas like the economy, trade and finance, political security and people-to-people -people exchanges. This has set an example of cooperation among emerging markets and countries. Facing the pandemic, the BRICS countries have demonstrated resilience and vitality and maintained the momentum of cooperation. 
This has provided an important example not only for our five countries, but the world in the fight against the pandemic and restoring the economies. While Beijing has been educating others on rules and order, it is accused by not one, but several countries of disregarding their territorial integrity. One of them is BRICS member India, with which it has been involved in repeated military standoffs. While some believe that BRICS could be a platform that can bridge the divide created between the two in the past few months, others feel it is just a symbolic exercise bringing nothing substantive on the table. Moving on. Days after Singapore registered MV Express Pearl caught fire off Sri Lankan coast and the joint efforts of India and Sri Lankan navies extinguished the fire, experts have called it the biggest man-made disaster of Sri Lanka ever. The ship has now sunk and there are fears of huge amounts of oil and toxic material getting released into the sea. Although the government has assured no leakage, the experts warn of the disaster affecting the country as far as India and Indonesia are concerned. A coastal oceanography professor said a sunken cargo ship, MV Express Pearl of the west coast of Sri Lanka, marked the country's worst man-made environmental disaster. The university's modeling indicated the plastic pellets from the ship, the raw material for shopping bags, would travel as far as Indonesia, India and Somalia. It, from an environmental point of view, it is the, the worst environmental disaster man-made or what we call anthropogenic. Uh, yes, we can, um, you know, you, we can talk about the, the tsunami of 2004. Uh, but that's a natural disaster. From a man-made disaster, this is the worst to hit Sri Lanka. Billions of plastic pellets have already fouled surrounding beaches and fishing grounds, forcing the government to take actions that could affect livelihood of thousands. The ship was carrying 1,486 containers, including 25 tons of nitric acid, along with other chemicals and cosmetics when a fire erupted on board after an explosion on May 20. Flaming containers filled with chemicals tumbled into the sea from the ship's deck as emergency crews sought to contain the blaze over the ensuing two weeks. Uh, three containers we know fell into the ocean, which yeah. contain what we call noodles, which are small plastic pellets, which um, there were 78 thousand kilograms of these noodles, which equivalent to about three billion particles. Okay. Um, and, and they were packed in a container, but also contained within 25 kilogram bags. And you may have seen images uh, that they are collecting a lot of that in terms of into the in the beaches, a whole kilogram bags, etc. So we don't know exactly how much of those noodles have been released into the ocean. Although ship's operators said in a statement that there were still no signs of a fuel oil spill and that much of the toxic cargo had been incinerated in the fire, the photos from the country's coast guard showed a layer of green film blanketing the ocean surrounding the vessel. The government of Sri Lanka is bracing for the possibility of an oil spill now. Never than at a Sampurnem, Modu Patule, Tienokila, Visasagarno, Eka Pudgalikoma, a diversla, Bahala, Balandon, Ekatama, Ilanga, Kilo Criavali. It was attending a heart, I am Criavalia Siduinonang, Ekriavali Sandaha, me, Neve, Tel Cocheratino, Tel Tieno, Ned. Meanwhile, the president of Sri Lankan Fisheries Society said he was worried that a ship sinking off Sri Lanka's west coast would be a death blow to the industry. 
tons of plastic pellets have swamped the island's coastline and rich fishing grounds, creating one of the biggest environmental crises in decades. The government has banned fishing along an 80 km stretch of coastline, affecting 5,600 fishing boats, while hundreds of soldiers have been deployed to clean the beach. The ship had begun to sink early on Wednesday. A salvage crew tried to tow the vessel to deeper water away from the coast, but the attempt was abandoned after the rear of the ship touched the seabed. Freedom of speech is alarmingly endangered in Pakistan. Some even say it disappeared long ago. Well, what else can be expected from a country that is as good as a vassal state of China? People backing or seeking freedom of speech and dissent have been targeted through a systematic crackdown by the establishment. From physical assaults to loss of employment to arbitrary inquiries against them, the defenders of free speech are facing it all. Hamid Mir, a renowned journalist, is the latest in the line feeling the heat of daring to speak the truth. Hamid Mir, a prominent Pakistani journalist, was sent off here by Geo News Network following his comments against Pakistan's deep state of the army and its increasing role in media censorship in the country. This comes in line with Prime Minister Imran Khan's military-influenced government cracking down on critics and dissenters. Mir had earlier participated in the anti-establishment demonstrations carried out to criticize the attack on another journalist, Asad Ali Tour, by some unidentified men. The men allegedly sent by Pakistani army had assaulted and tortured him at his home in capital Islamabad. Hamid Mir was one of the prominent voices who headed the campaign that followed to demand the freedom of speech, right to dissent and protection from extrajudicial measures to shut their voices. We have come here to condemn the, uh, the brutal attack on uh, three media workers in Karachi yesterday and uh, I have come here to express my anger on those people who says that uh, we want to negotiate with uh, those terrorists who have accepted the responsibility of the murder of three, three media workers. I think that the government should uh, make a difference very clearly and announce it that what is their policy. Although Prime Minister Khan and the military deny the accusation, the data collected in little over the past one year is contrasting and disturbing. As per a report published by Pakistan-based NGO Media Matters for Democracy, a sharp growth has been recorded in the number of suspicious deaths of journalists. Many others have been arrested and detained arbitrarily for reporting the truth. Earlier, New York Times reported that in the last five years, as many as 11 journalists have been killed in Pakistan, seven of them since Imran Khan became the Prime Minister. Several protest rallies have been carried out in the wake of the attack on Asad Ali Tour, but they seem to have been ineffective as of now. Journalists have threatened that they will start exposing what they have so far kept on the carpets in the name of the country. यहाँ पे हमारी हमें अपने घरों के अंदर घुस के हमारे दफ्तरों के अंदर घुस के हमें कत्ल किया जा रहा है इरशाद मस्तोई को 
घर अपने दफ्तर के अंदर घुस के लोगों ने कत्ल कर दिया पहले चोर छोटी चोरी करता है फिर बड़ी चोरी करता है अब ये इधर तक आ गए हैं और ये पैगाम वो दे, मैं देना चाहती हूँ जो हमें पाठ पढ़वाते हैं पेट्रियट पेट्रियटिज्म का उबुल वतनी का कि अगर हमने आपकी दास्तान सुनानी शुरू कर दी कि इस मुल्क में आपने क्या क्या किया है आपके क्या खिदमत हैं तो आपको मुंह छुपाने की जगह नहीं मिलेगी Pakistan's track record in press freedom has gone from bad to worse over the years. The 2020 World Press Freedom Index compiled by Reporters Without Borders reported that Pakistan was at 145th place out of 180 countries and the ranks have only declined under Khan's administration. Some observers say that Pakistan has been following Beijing's model when it comes to handling criticism and predict a similar situation in the country if the tacit yet widely known alliance of military and civil leadership is not reined in in time. And now in our section of Asia this week the stories from across the continent that made news this week. AstraZeneca has said it will soon deliver to Thailand the first 1.8 million doses of its COVID-19 vaccine produced by a firm owned by Thai King amid anxiety over vaccine supplies prior to a mass immunization program due to start next week. Thailand has 6 million doses of AstraZeneca's vaccine available among 61 million doses ordered which are to be manufactured locally by CM Bioscience a company owned by Thailand's king that is making vaccines for the first time The Southeast Asian country is struggling to contain its current deadliest COVID-19 outbreak and authorities have been scrambling to secure vaccines from more manufacturers accompanied by mixed messages about how the mass vaccinations will be carried out A huge fire broke out in an oil refinery in the southern part of Iranian capital Tehran on Wednesday. Iranian state media reported saying there were so far no reports of casualties. Iran's semi-official Tasnim news agency said all operations had been suspended at the facility known as the Tongyuan refinery as firefighters tried to contain the blaze. Thick plumes of black smoke over the refinery could be seen from different parts of Tehran. Shakir Kafai, head of Tehran Oil Refining Company, which runs a refinery, ruled out the possibility of sabotage. Itamuro Onsen in Japan's Nasushi Obara city is a famous tourist destination with hot springs and picturesque views. The area has a number of hotels due to coronavirus. Few tourists are coming to this city. However, some visitors are coming here for remote working. Ryoshi is a web designer. She is staying in the hotel where she is doing her office work without going to her office building in a much refreshed environment. This kind of lifestyle is called vacation. The word combines work and vacation. Today, first time vacation. I came to vacation. I came to vacation. うん、板室温泉を選んだのは東京から距離が近くてだいたい電車で1時間ちょっとぐらいで来れるっていうこととあともすごく自然が豊かだっていうのを聞いていてで、えー、来てみたらどうかなっていうお話を伺ったので、えー、今回来てみたというところですね。来てみたらとても静かなお部屋の中で集中して仕事もできるし逆に外を窓を開けると川の流れが聞こえてきたり。すごくあの自然を感じながらも仕事できるし、ちょっと休憩とかもできるので、あ、いいじゃないっていうふうに感じています。The Travel Association of Naso Shiobara is preparing to welcome customers by taking measures against the coronavirus. Japan is famous for the concept of long working hours. 
However, the pandemic situation has positively contributed to reduce stress among employees and raise their productivity by concepts like working vacation. Gaming companies of Japan have achieved record sales last year. This is because people stayed at home due to pandemic. As people stay indoors due to coronavirus, companies are presenting their games and devices as a way to beat the lockdown blues and remain socially distant through virtual reality. This youngster is doing exercises like running, jogging and push-ups. His coach is an electronic game while his parents play the role of fan. Sakuragi's family has bought an electronic gaming device after the corona pandemic which is helping family members regain fitness as they are staying indoors in the midst of the pandemic. <音楽>私も結構今運動不足を感じてまして年齢も上がってくるので何かをしたいなと思っててこう家で手軽にできるってすごくいいなと思ってちょっと続けたいと思います。ジムもちょっと今怖いですよね。同じものを皆さんで使うっていうのが、でまあ家族だったらもう大丈夫だと思って消毒もしやすいですし、あのあと人の目も気にならないですね。いくらこうあってやっててもなのでジムよりかはこ
Nepal's economy is largely dependent on agriculture, which accounts for 36% of GDP and absorbs about two-thirds of the labor market. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.